First of all, as they were political cults, maybe we should say, because I heard you say yours was Marxist, Leninist, and a bit Maoist, mm -hmm. which was the same as ours. Mm -hmm. Although we had, we did have to study Stalin. Oh, we did too. Yeah, even though I knew Stalin was a bad guy, but I right. somehow didn't, I let that go right. in the cult. Well, in, you know, in our group, we sort of half acknowledged that Stalin was a bad guy, but sort of rationalized it that he had to do what he had to do to protect you know, this nation that was being attacked over and over and over. So it was even, it was sort of normalizing him in right, that way. Right, So that wasn't great. But mostly we read a lot of really heavy-duty intellectual stuff that was around like at what? the time. Like the Italian guy, what's his um, name? Gramsci. Yeah, Gramsci, Gramsci. And, you know, because she was a sociologist, a Marxist mm -hmm. sociologist, my leader, and so we had these booklets that we put together that there were seven or ten of them and that's what we'd have to study and then the, in our group meetings our branch meetings mm -hmm. where we were divvied up you know the political officer would lead the study so I was always a political officer mm -hmm. and of course nobody ever had time to read this stuff mm -hmm. and it was very difficult reading very heavy academic kind of Marxist stuff and so that was always kind of a joke only at the time you didn't think it was a joke <laughs> so. I don't know if you did that, got, if your reading got that in depth. No, we, I mean, remarkably, we did very, once I got in, and I got in a bit after its peak, um, and it was very underground at the point I got in. It had yeah. been public for a bit, and then it went underground. And by the time I got in, there was very little study, which was kind of weird for me, because I'd been in San Francisco being a left activist where I was leading study groups. Yeah. No wonder we're friends. Um, <laughs> yeah. But they were open study groups, you know, they, yeah. were, they were okay. So what year were you in San Francisco? Well, I got there in seventy two, oh so God. I was there when it was still quite a lot going on. And when did you leave? Eighty two to move to Minnesota to be in this. So did cult. you ever go to the Liberation School? Yeah. Oh, I was teaching there. Did you know Mickey Ellinger? I'm sure. Yes. She was a. I was in a little subgroup with her. Yeah, I. Taught, she lived with me for a while. I taught Das Kapital. <laughs> I taught Das Kapital at the Liberation School. It's I taught all funny. this stuff there. And then when I got in the cult, you know, they were telling me. The right way to teach it and I would try to protest and of course that was the beginning of you know you don't challenge the leader well I oh, taught funny. not through the liberation I school we ever We'd realized not. that yeah. um, I taught not through the liberation school though I taught several classes there. Well, and there were two liberation schools the more lefty one and the more democratic socialist one I didn't yeah. know that yeah I, know. yeah I was the one that Mickey was associated yeah. and she had written that brilliant at the time, piece on women's, the economics of women's mm -hmm. liberation, I think mm -hmm. it was called, and mm -hmm. I, she, I thought she was great, but she got into a cult, I believe she got into, I might be misspeaking, but I think she got into the African People's Socialist Party, okay. which was a cult, and a lot of people got into, that was a bit later, but I used to teach smaller study groups which we recruited through putting leaflets mm. in the food bags of the food co-op that preceded the food co-ops that had storefronts. Right. It's the Peace and Freedom Party food co-op. Which we took over. <laughs> <laughs> we took over the Peace and Freedom Party. That's funny. So that we could get our candidates oh, on the ballot. Funny. Well, oh, yeah. we recruited for a study group, and I was teaching things like wages, price, and profit. Oh, yeah. Um, I teach I, I that now in my classes. It's a great, it's a great piece. Yeah. I recommend yeah. it to anyone. Um, so it's not, yeah, well, no, yeah, we've got very similar trajectories. So wait a minute, so you left in what year? 80? 80. 82, so around 79 or 80. I'm surprised we never recruited you. Well, I missed, I spotted a lot of cults. I, there was attempts to recruit me. I'll tell you the attempts. And you knew they were cults? Yes. Oh. But this one Clever went you. under my radar. So the, um. The RCP. No, 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 because I wasn't, I didn't, never like those kinds of groups. Um. I did briefly, I was in briefly the, um, I can't remember what they're called now, but they were Keep Strong. It was like the sort of white side of the Black Panther Party. Mm. And there's a wonderful picture of me, which shall not be made public, um, <laughs> on the Hey Ashbury selling the Black Panther Party mm. newspaper. Wow, wow. And, when I, and I used to be able to get rid of 100, you know, in a day. I was good. And then when I started well, realizing... No, 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 I was selling them oh, for okay. 25 cents. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then when I started getting disillusioned and realizing there was something really awry with this white arm of the Black Panther Party, as the Black Panther Party, I might add, mm -hmm. 
Um, Which my sales, I know, my sales dropped to zero. I couldn't shift a paper once mm. I got, you know, realizing that this is wrong. So I left that. So I did, I spotted that one as a dangerous group. Then there was the one, um, you know, the famous... Uh, you work on? No. East Bay, they, California homemakers, you know that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So a very dear friend the of California mine. California homemakers. Part of what's his name? Not like. a yeah, exactly. Yeah. So not a I, front group. Yeah. yeah. So I had a very dear we friend. We knew they were a cult. Actually, we right. talked about them as well. Right. So they, my dear friend, Lynn Tijerino, who's passed away, lovely woman, got into it with her, her husband, Luis, and she tried to recruit me. And I thought, oh, at first I liked it. And then I quickly realized it was bad. Then the third one, I got invited to a study group with this really important scholar and thinker, and he's you know really right on. He's come from the East Coast, and he's here. And a friend of mine invited me to the study group, and I went to the study group. It was all a bit hush hush. Who this was it? Fat old white guy. He wasn't that old then. <laughs> was going ram 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 paradigm this and uh, this paradigm then uh, that paradigm. Fred Newman. Oh, wow. And I only realized that when I started doing my dissertation and it came back to me, you know, my memory's not good right. as you know. And I went, wait a minute, I've heard this word paradigm before. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh. So all of those I saw as cults, but when mine came along, you know, it's what we talk about, right? Yeah. When we discuss this, yeah. you have to have the right cult at the right time. Right. And if you don't know the principles, if I'd known the principles of isolation, and control, I would have spotted mine as well. Do you think so? Yes, I definitely I, do. You know, I know we talk a lot about prevention and education, and I, I do think it's important, but I also wonder, even with all of that, if, if, you, if someone really would recognize it in the group that they're actually getting recruited into, because you're in this sort of honeymoon, as we call it, the honeymoon yeah, phase, yeah. and you're kind of you know, feeling a lot of pressure, peer pressure and rationalizing and feeling like, oh my God, I mean, I know I felt like, oh my God, I finally found something, you know, that was meaningful and would give meaning to my life. And so I always wonder if, if it, you know, if it really does make a difference. I mean, there's well, people who go into cults yeah. knowingly, like to go in undercover and end up getting recruited. Yeah. I mean, that's happened to journalists. That happened to Fred Green, Ford Green. He went in to get his sister and he ended up joining for a while, you know. Well, for me, I had so many questions on my way in. You know, is this, why are they doing this? Why are they doing that? And I was quite rebellious always. And if I'd, I think just, I can only speak for myself, if I had had a framework to understand that the things I was questioning were in fact the control things, the secrecy, the turning, not answering questions, the isolation again, the controlling your personal relationships, you know, obviously now you and I can spot a cult from three miles away. Right. Now we have, granted, had 10 years, as I like to call it, field work. <laughs> 35. <laughs> well, no, I mean in the cult. Oh, in the in cult, the cult. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm not saying it could prevention, could prevent everybody, but I do think there are signs you can teach people that give them a heads up watch out for this group. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't think that, I wouldn't be doing any of what yeah, I'm doing. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. I just, I just know that I had a lot of signs and a lot of times when I was like backing off. And then I would either rationalize by saying, well, my friends are joining and so it, mm -hmm. I'll go along for a while and see what happens. You know, it's probably okay. You know, nobody else is saying anything. Mm -hmm. So I'm probably just being petty bourgeois. Right. You know, all those things right. that get thrown back at you. Right. Or then... You know, it's kind of like today with the Trump era, you know, they'll distract you with something, you know, mm -hmm. so suddenly you get praised or you get promoted or you get... Because I do believe we, we, in that cult, good cult leadership at, at the lieutenant level, mm -hmm. because the cult leaders really don't do much, but at the lieutenant level, those who are guiding the troops, a good one will be able to sense when someone's starting to balk a little Absolutely. bit. Absolutely. And then yeah. they'll do whatever's going to work yeah. for that person. I mean, they used to send me on these... They used to send me on these weekends to to the wine country because I was, didn't get that. Not, well, because <laughs> I, you know I was in I was in top leadership. Yeah, I would get disgruntled about something, or they could sense it. And I mean, I remember once they sent me with my good friend who I had recruited, 
and they sent us off to the to, wow. to Sonoma to the Sonoma Mission Inn, which is this fancy spa place. We were there for the weekend. It was just it was just like heaven, wow. right? And then we came home, and they had assigned militants to plant a garden all around my yard, which of course died immediately because no one kept it up. You know? But they would do these things to like draw mm -hmm. me back in, you know, or they would punish you severely. It was one way or the other, right. you know, right. put you on silent restriction or something. Right. You know, to make, and then just isolate you, so you well, beg to come back. Well, that was a difference because I, you were a lieutenant, and I was the lowest of the low oh. in my group, so I didn't get that. The the one thing I remember is, I basically had what I look back on and think of as a mini nervous breakdown oh, yeah, at a certain that. point, which is a long story. But anyway, I was really I was having massive panic attacks, and I was I couldn't. Oh, it was awful, and I think I ended up in the emergency room because the they thought I was having a heart attack, and finally the doctors realized I was having a panic attack. So I came back, and we had, you know, I, I sent a memo, all the communication was by little memos in beige envelopes. So I sent them out saying, oh, you know, I was in the hospital, whatever. And I got back this thing saying, oh, you know, sorry you're unwell, take a few days off. And I mm. remember thinking, this, he's so kind. I didn't mm -hmm. even know it was a he, but leadership. Oh, they're so good and they're mm -hmm. so kind. You know, really like the domestic violence scenario. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This little brief let up right. in the pressure of the eighteen hour days. Right. Oh, they care about my right. well being. You know, and I just think back to that moment of like, you fool, <laughs> you know. Not yeah. fool, you know, I didn't understand. I um, know, I remember um when we were talking about studying and, and people would complain, like I don't have time to study, I don't have any time to study. So this would get back to our leader, and, she, and so then she would declare, we're going to have study nights. Mm -hmm. So every Thursday night, you had nothing to do, but you were supposed to stay home and study. But then at one point, they expelled someone because she stayed home on study night and studied. So it was, you know, it was kind of a setup. You yeah, know? yeah, quite <laughs> a double like, bind. Right? Exactly. Right, you know, right. I mean, you never knew what to trust when right. something like that happened. Back, I'm back on the subject of study, as because we'd started there and got distracted with the liberation school stuff, but... So we didn't study. So I had always studied, as I said, outside in my mm -hmm. previous life. But once in, there was a little bit of study, like of Mao's, whatever that, that not Mao. Book. No, we didn't no. study the Red Book. Sorry, I meant Stalin. So I get my totalitarian leaders mm -hmm. mixed up sometimes. <laughs> um, but his little pamphlet about the main blow, strategy and tactics or mm -hmm. something like that. So there was a little bit of study, but that soon went. And we just worked all the time. Mm -hmm. That's all. And mm -hmm. we worked... You know, there was a bit of bakery, there had been a bookstore for a while, that went. Um, a lot of people were doing all this computer programming, I never quite understood why. Um, and, you know, so you had your day job and then you, or whichever way it went, because sometimes I was working night shift as a machinist, and then the next day hours would be right. whatever yeah. the program was you were on. Right. We oh, there was a print shop still, my husband worked in the print shop, because I was in an arranged marriage, and I worked at the bakery, and we were supposed to be secret from each other. So he would come back with you know, ink all over his right. hands, and I was not supposed to know. And you smelled like flour. I, smelled, <laughs> I was not, and we were never to talk about it. It was a real crime right. to right. break security and right. talk. But this was just a the, the bakery was a public bakery, right. you know, but it was all secret. What? But and I would say, well, why is this helping the revolution? I mean, I couldn't grasp. It struggle with the practice you know it will come you will understand by struggling with the practice well how what what was the financial how did your group work financially see this is why i a lot of times people say well cults just want money and sex or the leaders and i say well not all of them right it's money what, sex or power they want i think principally the first thing i say is power, power. and control mm -hmm. then out of that you get some fringe benefits, which right. most people... Depending on the proclivities of the leader. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And yeah. I don't think our leader was hugely bothered with money. Yeah, we tithed a little bit, but it wasn't a lot. I think it was less oh. than 10%. Wow. At really times, lucky. like when he was, later on, he was um, wanted for murder, I think. And we didn't know that, and we were all asked to give money for a new HP computer, which after the, when we got out, we discovered was for his lawyer for mm. when he came back and gave himself up for that. But, but later on, sort of soon, maybe a couple of years before I left, so me and my husband had been running a computer company, sort of going 
sort of as part of the program, but it was also a little bit independent because things kind of got looser at the end. Mm -hmm. And we offered, we had like about $100,000 pro profit sitting in the bank and we sort of offered it. We sent a memo saying, wow. what should, more or less, what should we do with this money? Wow. And we got no answer. So you kept Thankfully, because that's how when I got out, yeah. I had a little bit of money. Oh, that's great. So I, he wasn't off the money, but yet sometimes he was because later I heard he had, you know, bankrupted this other people. Right. He did take various, well, like in other stories, one of my friends who was a comrade in the group, we were all supposed to have children and some of us couldn't, so then we were adopted children. And she was a single mother adopting and she, he said, well, you know, I'll help you, and I've got a contact to adopt this child, send me $20,000, which she did. So there's sometimes, so it was very, mm. you couldn't kind of make a logic out of it, and she, of course, the, yeah. that never... See, we had, our, ours was, was child. really a lot different. Yeah. We, we had a finance committee who figured out how much money the cult needed to feed the leader, whatever she was supposed to get, and run the whole operation. And then people were either assigned to either keep the job they had or get a job somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And other people were assigned to work internally full time. Mm -hmm. And then everyone who worked, so then a base was set. Everyone was to live on, say, $500 a month, mm -hmm. which was, it was always below poverty level. Right, right, of course. So then everyone who worked turned over everything they earned over $500. Any money they got, any gifts, any inheritances, tax returns, whatever. Everything had to be turned over. And those who worked internally would be given $500. Mm -hmm. Or you were told to like get on welfare or get on, some, you know, try some way so that the party didn't have to give you money. Um, and then a lot of money was funneled to her. And we had a doctor's office, we had the mm -hmm. research institute, we had a full service print shop from design through to boundary mm -hmm. that was public. Mm -hmm. So it printed not only our own materials, but we bid on jobs. Mm -hmm. So we printed for Wells Fargo Bank wow. and big catalog companies, yeah. and we could always underbid everybody because it was run on slave labor. Yeah. Um, so at the same time, we'd be you know having these customers come into the print shop who hopefully didn't see these bedraggled people who'd been working 20 hour shifts at the bindery you know um but it was a it was a lot about the money to run to run the operation and feed her because when when it ended you know she had bank accounts and iras and things that we couldn't touch because right, it was in her name right. a house and yeah. things like that so that's quite yeah, different yeah. in terms of the um the, the structure of yeah, each of the of groups. The, yeah. yeah, I mean, you never got to decide. So then they would tell you, like, we had lawyers, so they would say to the lawyers, well, you keep your job as a lawyer, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. mostly those lawyers worked at, like, the Legal Aid Society or whatever. And, um, but they still, everybody, if you worked a job, as soon as your job was over, you reported to whatever facility you were assigned mm -hmm. to to work. So mm -hmm. you might be a lawyer, get off work at 5 o'clock, and come to the print shop mm -hmm. and be a collator, you know, yeah, we for had, the rest of yeah, the night. And that was very similar. You, you didn't go home and eat right. dinner. And no, then, no, no, no. You no. just, like, yeah, every yeah. minute was covered. Yeah, that was the same. Yeah. We had lawyers as well and skilled computer programmers. And the same thing, they might be working at the bakery or whatever. And we, they had a computer company. They, there was this fantasy about, you know, we were going to do computing for the revolution, but not in a, <laughs> like... I think I was saying to you, you know, the com the program that com the computer program that solves all the problems, right. you know, the theory kind of, of everything, the totalist <laughs> computer program, and we had a company that was public called Dependable Computer Pro <laughs> Computers DCP, whatever that Dependable Computers, it's a sexy name, isn't it? They won't break down. And he had a construction company called Careful Construction. No, he's he so killed creative. somebody. Is, yeah. Um, so people were put in a lot of hours on the computer stuff and they would have regular computer jobs and then go to DCP for their mm -hmm. evening shift. And I mean, I never did. I mean, it was always a complete and utter failure. We were very good at failing our group in these kind of big ideas. Um, but I was going to ask you, so this thing of controlling time, so though he didn't necessarily control our money so closely, our, everyone's time was controlled very closely. And when I first got there so early on before I guess it's part of the indoctrination 
there was this form, which I don't have a copy of, sadly, which was the schedule. And you had to color code, you know, for a week. You know, when you were at work, when you were doing your laundry, uh, when you oh, were God. at the we, program. We didn't when, get time to do laundry. <laughs> well, we did laundry at midnight. Yeah. Or when you did shopping, which we did at, also in the middle of the night, there was, you had to color code time for sex. Whoa. And sleep, and of course, if you put in more than four hours for sleep, you could get criticized. So that kind of set everyone's expectations about this is, you know, what your schedule's supposed to be. And I read that the guy who wrote The Islamist, Ed Hussain, mm -hmm. the group he was in, which doesn't spring to mind, they also had a similar schedule mm. where they had to do that. So I was just curious if we, you had to... No, you know. we didn't have a personal schedule like that. I mean, we had... We sort of knew... Um, I guess by communication, I mean people, because this is before computer communication, mm -hmm. and, and in the beginning we were all in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. After a time we sent people out to other cities, but we would be, a person would be assigned to a facility. So say for example, I was, I was in leadership, so I had to go to all the whatever leadership meetings and trainings and prepare for the branch meetings and whatever, but then I was also assigned to uh, some other type of work. Eventually, like I was asked to build a publishing house. Mm -hmm. So I did my internal work and then I would go to the publishing house and would have people working under me who we would do whatever and it was a room within the print shop. Um, but there was nothing written and then you knew like Friday night and initially our, our branch meetings, like people were assigned maybe 10, 12 people to a branch. Initially when we were small there were like 25 of us we all met together on a Saturday and we'd meet from like 10 in the morning till 11 at night. Mm -hmm. Once we became, once we came, we grew a little bit and we stopped being underground and started doing mass work, then we switched our meetings to Friday nights because we wanted Saturday for organizing. So then we'd have, everyone had their branch meeting Friday night from like six o'clock until one o'clock in the morning, whatever, and that's where you paid your dues and mm -hmm. you did, you know, the political officer led study. And we had our little song book, and every meeting started with songs and ended with the international. And um, people would get criticized, a lot of it was criticism. Mm -hmm. So it was always anxiety making, like going to the department meeting, even if you were in leadership, like you never knew if, if something was about to spring on you, like some criticism. Um, and so people knew, and then, oh, then we had newspapers that we printed in English, Spanish, Chinese, and you would get a quota of news, everyone mm -hmm. got, say, 250 newspapers every two weeks or every week as they, you know, produced more. And you had to sell all those newspapers. And, of course, you worked at your facility till, say, 11 at night. So then you'd have to go to, like, the all-night grocery stores, like all-night Safeway, whatever. You had to find where people were after right, 11 o'clock right. at night. And try to sell these newspapers for a quarter. Um, so everybody knew us at these old night safeways and stuff. Um, and there are only so many in town, so we'd all be scurrying, you know. And and so you had to turn in that money. And when the when the thing ended, we found out that a lot of people, after a time, could, just couldn't bear selling those papers yeah. anymore, and were throwing them away. Yeah, yeah. And were going and selling their blood oh, to sure. have the money to pay for their newspapers in the in the branch meetings. Right. So every everybody, and then you'd get home from all that, and you'd have to write a security report, like any security violations that you committed, mm -hmm. and a self criticism, mm -hmm. and any security violations you saw anyone else do, like using the person's wrong name or not parking two and a half blocks around the corner, or mm -hmm. you know whatever. You had all incredible regulations, and then you may have had to been you may have been assigned to write a self criticism about something else, or you may have have to have to write a political study report or something. You know, so everybody's up till two, three right, in the morning right, right. typing. You know, those right, are the yeah, typing yeah, days, we, and you yeah, use yeah. carbon paper. Yes, and you had to push same. really, yeah. 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 And then you go to sleep and get up at yeah. five or six and start all over again, and go to the. You know, we used to go to like the BART stops, the, the subway stops mm -hmm. where people would be in the morning going to work so that we could sell more papers mm -hmm. or hand out leaflets about strike work we were doing or whatever. So it was just endless. It was endless. I mean, a it lot of awesome. that, except that we didn't have this public face. I mean, we they had had a public face, but before I joined, when they were destroying the political left in mm -hmm. Minneapolis, which seems to be the main goal of the group as far as I could work out. But anyway... 
But a lot of what you're describing was the same. So parking, yeah, it was a big crime to park near wherever you were actually going to meet mm -hmm. somebody. Mm -hmm. We always had to meet, like we'd have these midnight meetings which took place in the Biolis Cafe, which was the kind of all night supermarket cafe. So there's all these places in Minneapolis that I just have major triggers, you know, right. Perkins <laughs> and Biolis Cafe. <laughs> The carbon paper and the typing, all the reports constantly had to do, and the memos to PSS from NB25, which was one of my na names. Um, and uh, there was something else you were talking about. Um, oh, well, we had also the phone security, mm -hmm. where, so we lived maybe three or four people in an apartment. So, because again, pre-computer, so if you had a code, so my code was, you know, two. So if someone would ring twice, then hang up, and then they would ring again, and it would, that meant I had to answer the phone. And it was a real crime, and I got in trouble a couple of times if you answered the phone that was not else. on your code. And could you call from house to house? Because we could not. I'm sure we couldn't. We had to go to a uh, payphone. sure phone. we couldn't. Yeah, if we no, wanted no, no. to call a party house, we had to go to a yeah, payphone. Yeah, I'm sure that's yeah. true. We couldn't call house yeah. to house. And we had these little flip kind of check in, check out things to show you'd come home or you were out because mm -hmm. we lived in these duplexes and that was a big crime if you forgot to flip your card showing that you were in or out. Mm. Um, yeah, we had sign in sheets at the, like when you came to work, you signed in and signed out. Um, and no one ever came to our homes. I mean, the homes were very secure. You didn't let anyone know your address. Right. We had um, to use, we had to use, uh, like P.O. boxes to get yeah, out any yeah, regular yeah, mail yeah, so that yeah. no one could see your real name and things like right. that. Yeah, like my family didn't have my address. Right. Exactly. They just had a P.O. box. Exactly. Same thing. Um, Same thing. Oh, God. And then going down to the P.O. box was somehow always And then we had, we had our facilities. You know, we had the institute. We had the print shop. We had our staff headquarters. Uh, so we had at least three facilities. And we would have 24-hour guards at those facilities. Mm -hmm. Because of course the FBI was going to come and get us, you know, and so you you always lived in this moral fear that you were going to be tortured by the FBI, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So people were assigned guard duty. So I remember being like in the the, the print shop was in this warehouse district and um, south of Mission Street in San Francisco, which is now very gentrified mm -hmm. and posh, and everyone wants to live there. At the time, it was just. Horrible, yeah, you I remember, know, I remember warehouses, like, homeless yeah, people, yeah, you know, yeah. and there was a donut shop on the corner and that was it. And we were on, I think, the fourth floor or something. You'd go up these big old elevators and then you'd have guard, you'd be on guard duty by yourself in this building all night after everyone left and you'd be there till six or seven in the morning. And, and we had to hide all the documents. Like in one of our uh, places, we ripped up the floorboards and you'd have to put all the documents under the floorboard. And I, and I remember I used to lie there and think, what if they came? What what would I do? Right. <laughs> like, well, I wasn't armed. I, you know, would I just like pass out? Like, what in the world? You know, but you were just all night, yeah. you know, like quivering because yeah. what if they came or what if they came and you didn't defend and, you know, then you'd really get criticized or we'd get tortured. Or, you know, it was just all this like paranoia used to like keep you tied to the group, you know, keep you afraid of the outside world. I mean, when I interviewed people for my study from the Newman group, they had a similar thing, and I had a woman telling me the story of very similar to you, although I think they were armed. Oh, they but were. But they armed. didn't know yeah. how, some yeah. of them didn't know how to use the weapons, yeah. which is well, we were very armed. American. But. I mean, we were armed in the sense that the leader had a huge stash of guns, yeah, most people didn't yeah. know that. Those of us in the inner circle yeah. knew it, yeah. but. Well, clearly our leader was on because he killed somebody with right. one of his guns, but nobody else was. We were yeah. a bunch of wimpy yeah. white people. The Eagles would get those kinds of assignments, um, which was always a joy, or beating up someone on the left or slashing tires. or The same thing. We destroyed the yeah. left more than anything yeah. else. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there was definitely violence in my group, but it was, again, that was really more before I was there, and that was more in the kind of, you know, ideological, you know, people... Like one couple were, who were married and loved each other, you know, were set up to have boxing match together. And the guy, you know, by mistake, you know, broke her rib. Oh, my God. And, you know, then they were made to divorce and, you know, all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. Um, people were paddled for various mm. crimes. Wow. Um, yeah, this was but before I joined, but these were all the stories I heard when I was writing well, my first like book. the Black Panther Party. I mean, they used to whip people. 
Yeah, yeah. Which we, no one ever talks no, about. No, no one. They no still one, uh, idolize the Black they Panthers, do. and they I do. try to raise Mythologize. awareness that we yeah. read a bit about the people, read the accounts of the people right. who are in it. Yeah, read Elaine, Elaine Brown, Brown Elaine Brown's and David book is Hilliard. All you need to yeah, read. and David, and David Hilliard's Hilliard. book. Yeah, and then and tell me about the Black Panthers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I Hugh, I'm afraid Huey was he was very charismatic, and he was a bully. Yeah, not to mention a drug addict. But, yeah, and he, you know. We have to look at our history and be critical on yeah, that. Um, yeah. uh, we don't want to repeat these mistakes. We will, but let's try and repeat them less often. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>